thank you very much for coming along this morning to learn more about Bluestream's range of products. Uh, Bluestream's always been a personal favourite of mine for audiovisual distribution. Um, commercial jobs, domestic jobs, uh, yeah, and everything in between. The reliability, the stability of the product, as well as how forward thinking they are about their product range has always been exceptional. You'll see some examples of that today where they're already looking at the next generation of distribution in a very, very clear and very special way. Um, Bluestream is an Australian company, very proud that they're in Melbourne as well. Um, based strongly their research and development here and everything else as well means we've got quick support and quick backup whenever we need it. Um, particularly for me, the video over IP and the HD base T solutions have been ones I've recommended and used for a very long time, so very, very impressive. It's great to have Daniel here today. He's obviously one of their tech gurus and one of their specialist trainers, so he's going to take you through a whole range of different things and uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank Cheers, you, Daniel. Thanks. So thanks for coming today. Um, I'm going to take you through, um, firstly, a bit about Bluestream, and then I want to take you through HDMI 2.1, the future, and what it's going to bring for us, some of the technologies that it uses. And we'll touch on 4K 18 gig distribution as it currently sits today, what Bluestream offers in that space, um, as well as video over IP, audio over IP with Dante, and then I'll show you some of our commercial solutions and our new products that we're offering. So just a little bit about Bluestream to begin with. Um, who are we? Um, well, we're an Australian company um, designed with market-leading features from installer feedback and from previous experience in the market. Um, we have a very strong focus, a very, a very strong experience with our local market, and we're engineered with value for money um, in mind as well. Our market solutions include HDMI distribution, HD base T, video over IP, audio distribution, uh, and a lot of audio accessories or video accessories to complement an installation. Um, we have a busy and exciting R&D schedule. Um, our head office is here in Melbourne, in Mount Waverley, where we head up all our R&D uh, tech support and assistance. We believe that our success is built on a combination of our feature set, our price and our reliability, and we've found a, a good way for all of these attributes to coexist and work well together. So we believe we've got the right features for the market, competitive price point, uh, and reliability um, to rival our competition. So these have been the cornerstone that's helped Bluestream grow and, and Bluestream success over the years. Um, our engineers are based around the world, so we have our marketing and a, a support office in the UK, um, distribution as well in the UK and through Europe in Spain, uh, engineering and production in China and in Taiwan. Um, and as a result, we've got a dedicated support system that covers about 20% of the, uh, sorry, 20 hours in a day um, obviously Australia during our waking hours and you can always contact the UK during their waking hours um, and they come online about six o'clock in the afternoon uh, in the evening uh, worldwide training events so we just exhibited at ISC this month and road shows and trade shows etc um, interactive web webinars and our advanced learning portal um, we run constant webinars this is handled through our UK guys at the moment which is which is great. They generally do it first thing in the morning for them, which is about five to six, maybe seven o'clock at night for us. So once you get off work, you can go home and do some more work. Um, they're only short webinars, they're about 15 to 20 minutes each, but they give you a bit of information on specific topics or products. We also have our advanced learning portal. Um, you can sign up from our website. All of our webinars, all of our technology information, and all of our product information is available on our learning portal, and you can sign up and go through that in your own time. There's a lot of content there to help educate yourself. So I want to dive straight into HDMI 2.1 and look at what's coming. I'm not going to cover anything about what we've had or what we have currently with HDMI 2.0. Um, just jump straight into HDMI 2.1 and some of its key features and key technologies. Um, so it increases bandwidth from 18 gig all the way up to 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth. So three times the amount of bandwidth, resolutions up to 10K, frame rate up to 120 hertz. Is anyone else uh, in this room a gamer? There's a few there. Anyone excited by some of these? <laughs> no, couldn't care less. Um, a lot of these features actually are targeted towards not only gaming but VR, which is a booming industry as well. Um, and will only improve things going forward. So we've got variable refresh rate, quick media switching, low latency mode, display stream compression, EARC, HD, uh, dynamic HDR, and a few other things. And I'll touch on each of these in the consecutive slides. So firstly, looking at resolution. Um, we're currently sitting at 4K here. This is our current resolution. And 8K offers us 
uh, two to, or four times the amount of pixels on a display, two times the width, two times the height. 10K, uh, this is a standard 16 by nine uh, aspect ratio. And then 10K actually just gives us basically extra wide screen um, to a 2.35 to one ratio. So more cinematic. Uh, a lot of computer monitors are moving to this widescreen notion as well, um, moving forward. Support for up to 120 hertz frame rates. Or 10K up to 120 hertz frame rates. This actually gives us a total bandwidth of 120 gigabit per second, and there are formats beyond this as well. How are we gonna handle 128 gigabit per second when I've just told you that HDMI 2.1 is 48 gigabit per second in bandwidth? Uh, HDMI 2.1 will use DSC or display stream compression, which is a VESA standard, to compress a larger signal, 120 gigabit per second in this instance, down to 48 gigabit per second to be transmitted over a HDMI cable. Uh, it'll use a variable compression of up to three to one, um, but the, the important thing is that the time for uncompressed HDMI video is over. Moving to the future, we will be using compression for HDMI 2.1. And basically, any of these formats highlighted in red um, are over the 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth, and as a result, we'll need to, be, uh, we'll need to go through this DSC process to, to be compressed to work with HDMI 2.1. And basically, it's any of the high frame rate scenarios, so anything over 100, 120 frames, and anything from 4K above 420 onwards, uh, sorry, for 8K above 420 um, chroma sampling onwards, will use display stream compression to transmit that signal. So I guess it's important to understand that there's an industry um, preconception that compression is a bad thing. It's 100% required to deal with high bandwidth signals. So some of the technologies HDMI 2.1 is focusing on is advanced gaming. And some of those features are variable refresh rate. So this will re reduce or eliminate lag um, and frame tearing for more fluid, better detail gameplay when frame rate changes. So if you've got a graphics card that can't quite support the frame rate of your display, 120 hertz, then the frame rate jumps up and down and this can cause frame tearing. You see a line through the screen that causes a few issues um, in that regard, in visual issues. So this is designed to overcome that and handle variations in frame rate um, much more, uh, with a much better result to the end user, less impact on the end user. Auto low latency mode is also implemented to allow for smooth lag free viewing um, and adjust itself automatically based on the content. So you may, you may know that in displays, there's a lot of video processing going on to sharpen the image, to get the change colors, et cetera, et cetera. This all introduces system lag or input lag into the, uh, the display. Some TVs or some displays have a sports mode or a game mode that remove the video processing to speed up the input lag. And this will basically automatically do that based on the content that's coming in. So it sees the games coming in and it'll switch to the low latency mode. It sees sports coming in, it'll switch to low latency mode, and then a movie comes in or a cutscene, and it will change back to um, the video processing, give you the better picture. Um, quick media switching is also implemented in HDMI 2.1. And if you've ever changed resolutions or you're watching a Blu-ray, you're in the Blu-ray menu, it's a 24 hertz menu, you change to play the Blu-ray and the Blu-ray is 60 hertz, you get a blank screen uh, while it drops and renegotiates the resolution. This is designed to eliminate the blank screen in between changes of resolution. So it works alongside the variable refresh rate and it allows refresh rate changes on the fly without dropping the handshake or renegotiating the handshake. So the end result is if you're changing between sources as well that are different resolutions, you might have an old Foxtel box that's 1080p, a new Apple TV that's 4K, and the screen has to drop to renegotiate new uh, format. Um, this can overcome that and eliminate all the blanking frames in between changing your frame rates. And this works hand in hand with quick frame transport, um, which is designed to reduce latency when this all occurs. So a few new technologies coming there, I guess pr primarily targeted around VR and gaming, but will Im Im uh, improve all content and changing sources between content as well. And we also have EARC or Enhanced Audio Return Channel coming to HDMI 2.1. And it brings some 
um, I guess, big improvements to getting audio back from a TV to an AV receiver. And the biggest one is the increase in bandwidth to 37 megabit per second, which means it will now support Dolby, Atmos, DTSX, HD Master, all of those formats, uh, DTS HD and Dolby HD Master, uh, etc. Um, it also builds the CEC into the EARC channel. Hopefully this means CEC will be more reliable. We'll wait to see how that pans out. Um, lip sync correction is also mandatory. And so there's a few additional features that ARC fall back to older versions as well. So that's a good, a good enhancement coming um, as well. Dynamic HDMI is also going to officially or properly be supported. Um, it's kind of been botched together by um, the companies that are outputting um, dynamic HDR content. But this will be officially supported now by HDMI 2.1. So HDR10+, uh, SLHDR2, which is a new format coming, and Dolby Vision using its proprietary metadata will now use standard dynamic HDR metadata. Um, so only some portions of content that require HDR will receive that HDR. Um, this will have a big impact on gaming where it may switch to a cutscene where you want HDR, but then you may be playing the actual game and you may not want HDR because you want it to be brighter or things like that. So it gives a lot more flexibility in the way HDR is used in content and on a frame by frame or scene by scene basis. For instance, in broadcast, there may be an application where you're watching a movie, you want that to be HDR, but you're watching uh, a commercial in between the movie, you don't want that to be HDR. It's really important to understand the cable requirements of HDMI 2.1. We are dealing with much greater bandwidth, 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth, over 18 gig for the current standard. Ultra high speed cables will be required. Um, this is the formal logo, the official logo from HDMI org. It means that you've given cabling to HDMI org, paid them a, lot, a nice sum of money, and they've given their stamp of approval for you to, uh, to certify your cables as supporting a 48 gig signal. Um, be, be aware it is important that cables you use that you want to support HDMI 2.1 must say that they support 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth, otherwise they won't work. Another interesting fact is that a passive cable will have a maximum distance of two to three meters for HDMI 2.1. So how am I going to run my cable to my projector uh, from my wall plate? That's going to be very difficult. Manufacturers will use AOC or optic cables to do this. The standard isn't specified by HDMI, so it'll be each manufacturer to themselves. Um, we'll see how this pans out. Connector types will be very standard. They're backwards compatible. It'll use the same HDMI connector. Um, but the really important thing to understand is when you're buying or when you're selling HDMI cables is to understand the marketing and manufacturing claims. This is no BS, this is an actual packaging we've come across. Advertising an older HDMI cable. It says 100% Mylar double shield 1.3 grade cable with antivirus protection to reduce virus noises and obtain perfect image transition. Exactly. That's right. So. HDMI viruses are a load of BS, but it's important at least to understand and educate your customers that some marketing claims are not always factual. Um, they may be put there as a bit of a laugh. So, but it's, it, the important thing to take away is that 48 gig bandwidth is 100% required for HDMI 2.1, and make sure you're obviously buying from a reputable company and they support this amount of bandwidth in that specific cable. HDMI 2.1, um, the biggest change is actually in the way it operates and what's called fixed rate link. Um, it's the signaling technology used with HDMI 2.1. It replaces the TMDS or time minimized differential signaling used in HDMI 2.1, uh, sorry, 2.0. It uses a new error correction technique called the Reed Solomon forward error correction. I won't bore you with the specifics. If you've got time and you wanna be put to sleep, there is a white paper from HDMI org on all of this, you're more than welcome to read it. It's on their website or we can send it to you. Um, but basically, HDMI 2.0 used three six gig channels and then a separate channel for the clock, the TMDS. HDMI 2.1 repurposes that clock, that TMDS channel, uh, and gives us four 12 gig channels. So we're doubling the bandwidth and we're using that additional channel to give us 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth. And it's incorporating um, the fixed rate link into, or the clock into the data channel, instead of being a separate, uh, a separate channel. 
So TMDS is included for backwards compatibility. So do we need HDMI 2.1 and 8K? Well, with the average 2020 vision, which I clearly don't have, I need glasses, and a 65 inch display, THX and CDA recommend viewing distance of 2, point, uh, 2 meters and 2.4 meters respectively. And at this distance, the eye resolves about 44 DPI, dots per inch, um, uh, or dots or pixels per inch if you like. A 65 inch 4K TV, is 68 DPI. So a 4K 65 inch TV has more resolution than my eye can pick up at that distance. An 8K TV has 134 DPI, has way more resolution than my, uh, way more de pixel density than my eye can, can distinguish from 2.4 meters. So is it necessary in those sorts of settings? Necessity isn't always the reason that drives us to buy things. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that there may be applications where 8K simply isn't suitable or isn't required and won't give you a benefit. Having said that, if you're selling displays, fantastic. Push 8K, go, go nuts with it. Um, some really cool features though, EARC, extending ARC to additional formats is a great feature. You'll get Atmos and those formats back through ARC. HDR is becoming uh, improved. So in the past, if we wanted HDR, we had to compromise in one way or another from a perfect 4K 60Hz 444 signal, either dropping the frame rate or dropping uh, the chroma sampling. Now you can get a full 4K 60Hz 444 HDR signal. Dolby Vision gets official support um, and we can support higher frame rates. So 120 Hz, which is great for the gaming market and VR. Planned obsolescence also gives us an opportunity as well, a business opportunity there, a way to sell new equipment, new cabling, new product, um, and upspec a customer or improve a customer's current offerings. So there are pros and cons there to 8K. Regardless, it's coming. We just have to embrace it. Any questions there on 8K, on HDMI 2.1? Yep. How far away is the cable? Well, we still don't really have any real world source devices. <coughs> that support 8K. Um, there are some displays that support 8K and you read the fine print and it's generally through content on the USB disk, not via HDMI. Um, cables aren't that far away. Um, one of our manufacturing partners has the technology to test cables for 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth, some expensive machinery, but it is possible. Um, I don't think we'll personally adopt it until the market is more mature. It's still a little bit too early and we don't think the market is prepared to pay the additional costs associated with it until source devices and TVs are more readily available. But we're definitely on top of that and we will have our solutions available um, when the market's ready. Some part of the market has to be early adopters to... Correct. And, and, to pay the and when the business case makes sense, then we'll be on board. So now I want to talk to you about the current Bluestream offerings for distributing a current 4K 18 gig signal. Um, when 8K signals are uh, more readily available, as I said, we'll have solutions available. We do have engineering resources being used at the moment in the background looking into these offerings. Um, and as I said, when, when the business case is suitable, we'll present products to you and offer those to you as well. So the first method and the call it premium method, the best way of getting a 4K 18 gig signal distributed throughout a premises is using HDMI cables. Um, so there are three methods in which we employ to do that. For lengths of half a meter to seven meters, we use copper. And the seven meter cables are obviously thicker than the half a meter cables. The thicker the copper, the bigger the pipeline, the more bandwidth you can feed through. Um, from 10, 15, 20 meters, we use active cables. So it's copper with an active chipset in the display end the cable is now directional, um, but the, the chipset basically equalizes and boosts the signal to support 18 gig over the longer lengths. And for 30 to 100 meters, we use AOC or active optic copper cables, and the video signal is distributed via the fiber portion of that, and the handshake still happens along the copper. So there are three technologies we employ there to give you full uncompressed 18 gig signals via HDMI cables. To go along with that, we have three matrix products, HDMI only matrix products, um, to distribute those HDMI signals. 
our CMX88, which is an 8 HDMI input, 8 HDMI output device, the CMX44, which gives us 4 HDMI in and out, and then a CMX42, which is 4 inputs and 2 outputs. Um, the two CMX44 and 42 products have IR routing built in, uh, the CMX88 does not. Um, they all have uh, audio breakout um, in analog and digital, and the CMX88 brings with it TCP IP, so web GUI, um, RS232 uh, control as well. Um, all products have RS232 control, and all products have EDID management to control the source, uh, the format being transmitted by the source device. We also have HDMI splitters and switches, all supporting 18 gig. So an SP18 is a one input, eight output splitter. Great if you've got to distribute, say, Foxtel to eight different displays, um, or one source device to, to many displays. We've also got a one in, four out, a one in, two out. Um, they have uh, audio breakout as well on the, on the small products if you need to break audio out. And all the products there have EDID management for controlling the source device's resolution. Uh, we also have switches, um, so instead of going from one source to many displays, we can go from many sources to one display. So SW41AVV2 is four inputs, one output, and then the 21 version is two inputs to one output. So if you don't want an AV receiver but you've got multiple sources, um, you can put one of the switching boxes in. And again, 232 control on the 41, um, IR control on all of these products, and EDID management and audio breakout. Any questions there about the HDMI only products? Yep. Okay, I'd, I, yeah, so I'd be curious to hear about issues you have had with mixing cables because typically active cables will draw power from the display. So it should be the display powering the cable. Perhaps or there may be some cables that draw power from a splitter and that could potentially cause problems. Um, typically active cables um, also, or our active cables at least, can, uh, can be powered if need be with additional power via micro USB. So if cables don't have that, they may be drawing too much current. That could, be, that could potentially cause a problem if they're drawing outside the current of HDMI spec. No, ours, they should drive, well, again, ca cable quality is important. We know that they'll drive the blue stream cables without a problem. Um, we can, we've tested and verified that. There are too many cables on the market to say, yes, it supports every single cable. Um, the quality of every cable can vary. The thickness of the strands inside the cable can vary. Um, and really, with cheaper cables, that's the biggest caveat, is that they use less copper in the cable. They may use it, we've seen some cables with aluminium instead of copper. Um, they use thinner copper to begin with, and that can impact signal distribution. But our splitters meet the HDMI spec for transmission voltages. Yep. With your UI out of the splitters and switches, is there any uh, limiting formats? So all of the Bluestream products, except for this product here, which I'll show you at the end, um, the audio breakouts are all limited in the sense that for the analog output to work, you have to feed an analog, uh, sorry, you have to feed a two channel PCM signal in. It doesn't do Dolby down mixing or conversion. Um, we do have a product here that does, and I'll show you that towards the end. The optical or coaxial outputs, I should say, um, will support multi channel audio output. But they are limited in the sense as well because coaxial doesn't support Atmos. So there are limitations there as well. All right, so moving on now to the 4K 18 gig distribution over HD base T. So what is HD base T? Uh, it's a connectivity standard for distributing uncompressed 4K video uh, over a CAT cable. It supports video, audio, ethernet, control, and power. Uh, and in return, you can also get audio, ethernet, and control back. Now it's important to understand that HD base T and its CAT infrastructure is limited to 10 gigabit per second of bandwidth. So it's quite limited in that we're, we can distribute potentially up to 18 gig signals, um, but we're, we're limited by this distribution medium of 10 gigabit per second of bandwidth. So how do we handle 18 gig signals with HD base T? There are two technologies on the market currently. Um, one is called CSC or color space conversion, where we convert the color gamut, uh, reduce the color gamut to transmit that over HD base T. And the other is DSC or display stream compression, where we compress the signal 
to distribute that over HD base T. So the way in which CSC works is it takes a 4K 60 hertz 444 signal, an 18 gig signal, and a transmitter or a matrix converts that to 4K 60 hertz 420. So it converts it from 18 gig down to 10 gig, transmits that over HD base T, and at the other end we do what's called reverse CSC, where we convert the format back to 4K 60Hz 444. Now, it's important to understand how this works. We're not here to pull the wool over your eyes. We're going to tell you how it is. But when we convert from 444 to 420, the color information is lost. We remove it. When we convert from 420 back to 444, we don't add any additional color information. We just basically put it in a nice new shiny box, a nice new wrapper, and say it's 444. So the TV thinks it's getting a 444 signal, but the actual color information is at a 420. I'll show you that on the next slide. Sure. Um, likewise with HDR, if we feed in a 10-bit signal here, it gets converted to 8-bit here. And at the other end, we add the metadata in to say we're a HDR 10-bit signal, but the color information is still that of an 8-bit signal. We remove that information. Um, this is a cost-effective way of supporting an 18 gig signal. And we say supporting, not distributing or not, not transmitting an 18 gig signal because it does convert it to 10 gig. The important thing to understand is that all Bluestream products with CSC also have a HDMI loop out. And that HDMI loop out will still support a full 18 gig signal. So you can get in your theater zone, you can still maintain that full 18 gig signal via HDMI. And then you can still distribute it to another zone anywhere else in the house using CSC. Um, you know, something like Foxtel, for instance. So I suppose the, the, the positive is we can now distribute an 18 gig signal. Now, what does that look like? Well, converting from 444 to 420, um, this is the, the chroma subsampling, it's called. Um, with full sampling, uh, the first digit here re references Luma channel, and the second and third digits reference to chroma or color channels. Um, so every pixel, imagine these are the pixels on our display, every pixel gets its own Luma channel in both instances. In a 420 instance, every 2x2 two two array of pixels shares the same color information. So in a, four by uh, in a 444 application, every pixel has its own color information, and 420, every 2x2 two two array shares its color information. And so the net effect is that you have slightly reduced color set um, every, every pixel still has its own brightness, but it shares the, the color information. So there is a little bit of color loss, but to the human eye, it's, it's minor. At 60 frames a second, you wouldn't notice it. So are we talking about two different, there's two different band bandwidths of line here? Or? Correct. So if, so if we divide a line down the middle, this would be if we were sending or handling an 18 gig signal over HD base T, and this would be if we're handling a 10 gig signal, or we're reducing it to 10 gig. So that's by, by reducing the color information to a quarter, we're reducing the bandwidth from 18 gig to 10 gig. Yeah, yeah, we're halving the, the video bandwidth. And the impact to the human eye is very minor. Um, you can actually test this yourself if you've got any of the Bluestream products and two properly calibrated displays. You can feed the CSC output to a receiver to one display and the HDMI loop out, feed that to your second display. And you can directly compare CSC and non-CSC together. And you'll see, unless you did that comparison, you wouldn't know the difference. It's that minor. So how does DSC work? Well, very similarly, except we take our 4K 60 hertz signal, we compress that, and DSC uses a two to one compression in this instance. So it'll convert an 18 gig signal to nine gig, um, or an 11 gig signal to five and a half gig. And then at the other end, the receiver will uncompress that signal. This is technically a superior method. Um, it does, however, use or require a compression chipset in one end and a decompression chipset in the other. And it uses a Visa standard, which unfortunately requires licensing. Um, but technically, it is the, the, the better format and it supports HDR metadata. So the pros and cons are the four for each unit. Um, CSC is more cost effective. No licensing fees are required. It integrates flawlessly with HD base T and it's backwards compatible. So what that means, um, a CSC transmitter, and I have pre-existing HD base T infrastructure that doesn't support CSC, at least within Bluestream. 
that will still get a picture. It'll be a 420 picture instead of 444, but it will still display a picture without a problem. Um, we're only converting color. We're not changing the resolution. We're not changing the frame, excuse me. We're not changing the frame rate, which uh, DSC can, compresses everything. DSC is considered visually lossless. So what goes in should be the same as what comes out. It's a better picture of the two methods, mathematically at least. It's a Valens approved method. So Valens are the manufacturer of HD base T. They've approved this method. Having said that, HD, uh, HDMI org have also approved this method as it's used in HDMI 2.1. Um, and it's a Visa standard. And obviously it supports HDR metadata without losing any of that information. Now, there are a few products on the market with this. And up until recently, they had a few major issues. Some resolutions, they simply didn't work. The resolutions, they did work. They worked really well. Um, Bluestream have decided not to go with a DSC solution. And I'll show you why in a second. So the products that we currently have available with CSC built in, um, we have three transmitter receiver kits and a few matrix products. Hex 70 CS will distribute 4K up to 40 meters. Hex 100 CS will distribute uh, 4K up to 70 meters. And we have a Hex 150 CS, which will distribute uh, 4K up to 100 meters. Now, they all use CSC, um, the color space uh, technology, conversion technology. The key difference, so that the 70 and the 100 are identical physically. One uses a class B chipset, one uses a class A chipset. They all have a HDMI loop out, so you can always maintain a full 18 gig, uncompressed, unmolested, untouched signal um, via the HDMI output. And then the Hex 150 CS kit also adds audio return channel if you want to get ARC back from a display, and it adds Ethernet to send uh, that over HD base T as well. Uh, and they've all got audio breakout in one way or another as well. And it also has a long reach mode to do 1080p up to 150 meters. So great for those applications where you require longer distances. And the reason why Bluestream have decided not to bring out a DSC solution is because of this, the Valens VS3000 range. So Valens is the company that make the HD base D chipsets. And they showed this off at ISE this month. And we've been on board with this chipset for the last, uh, since last year. Um, and this is basically a new uncompressed chipset from Valens that Bluestream will be adopting in time. And we'll have a product available shortly that will utilize this technology. Um, it actually transmits up to 16 gig one way downstream, down a cat cable, and two gig um, via the auxiliary turn channel to get data back. Um, so this will support a full 18 gig 4K signal. And basically we remove the blanking in HDMI frame so bits of information that are off screen that don't affect viewing the actual content, we remove them to reduce bandwidth. That's how HD base T works. And that's why there's 16 gig of, of downstream bandwidth. Oh. Now, one of the key features of having two gig of bandwidth upstream means HD base T can do what they call port duality. You can actually send a 1080p video from the receiver back to the transmitter at the same time as sending a video to the display. So where this could be useful is if you've got a source device local to a TV, you could send that at the same time back to a comms room, to a, to a rack, um, while you're getting a picture locally, all at the same time while getting other sources along HD base T. So you could have an NVR, you could have a Foxtel box or something like that being transmitted back at the same time. So very, very flexible in that regard. And because of the increased bandwidth, it also can now send up to gigabit ethernet. Previous solutions have been typically um, uh, about 300 megabit per second of bandwidth. USB is also improved up to 350 megabit per second of bandwidth and on chip HDCP and audio embed and de-embed. So that's, that will come out we hope this year, um, but that's essentially why we've, we've decided against the DSC technology. We also have a 4x4 four four HMXL 44CS uh, kit. This has four HDMI inputs, four HD base T inputs that all support CSC. So this will support an 18 gig signal. And you can always maintain that untouched 18 gig signal via the HDMI out for a theater zone. So you can still get the best picture quality 
in a theater zone via HDMI output and at the same time distribute that um, via HD base to anywhere in a property. Cost effective, audio breakout, um, web GUI, iOS, Android app control, um, audio breakout, RS232 to each zone, quite a full featured matrix there. Now, one of the key features this matrix also has, and one of the, this is built into our CSC technology as a whole, and a way in which we're trying to help overcome um, issues with 4K and 1080p screens in a system is what we're calling smart scaling technology. And this is built into our CSC products. It will work on a 4K 420 or 444 signal. And it will actually be able to convert that signal down to a lower resolution. And one caveat is this will not work on a 422 signal. I'll touch on that in a second. But basically, if I have my matrix here and I feed it in a 4K 6444 signal, I can output that to two native 4K displays, 18 gig displays. And at the same time, if I've got an older, like a first generation 4K display that only supports 4K 420, I can, it will automatically convert the signal down to 4K 420. And maybe in another zone, I've got an old 1080p display. It'll also convert that signal down to 1080p on a per output basis. Now it won't work with a 422 color space 4K signal. It will pass a 422 signal through to the native 4K displays, but it won't down convert that to other formats. It's unfortunately a limitation of the chipset used. And the only real world impact on that is if you're trying to get HDR out of Foxtel, Foxtel will output 422 HDR. All, you, all it means is you set the EDIR on our product to 4K60444 and Foxtel will then output 4K42, uh, a 4K50 Hz 444 signal, which will be able to be smart scaled to these resolutions. If you need more inputs and outputs than our 4x4 matrix allows, you can use our custom pro, uh, either our 8x8 chassis or we have a 16x16 16 chassis now as well to give you more inputs and more outputs. And you specify this matrix specifically for your job to its requirements to a T. Um, we have multiple input and output cards that you would spec to meet your requirements. So we have legacy uh, old HDMI 1.4 input and output cards. If your customer doesn't need 4K, they just want 1080p or they're price constrained, these options are great. And then we have a two HDMI 2.0, a four HDMI 2.0, a two HDMI and two VGA input card, and a two HDMI and two HD based input card. So you can also feed remote sources in um, using the HD based input card. So you could have a source in another zone you need to get back to a comms area. You could do that via HD based T and then distribute it out again. Output cards, we have a large range of output cards, uh, two HDMI, four HDMI output cards, uh, we have both HDMI 2.0 and a legacy 1.4 cards. Uh, these are legacy, uh, basically HD based T cards without CSC, so that don't support the 18 gig output. And then we have two ranges of cards that do support the 18 gig CSC. Um, whether you need 70 meters at 1080p or 4K at 40 meters, or if you want 100 meters at 1080p or 4K up to 70 meters. And those cards are either two HD based T out, four HD based T out, or simultaneous HDMI and HD based T out, um, four of those. So very, very flexible, specify this to meet your job's requirements of inputs and outputs. IR output cards, 232 output cards, audio breakout cards, and the control board with WebGUI and 232 is built into the, the matrix. So that's provided to you. Any questions there about CSC or HD based T? Yeah, so if, if depending on the cards you choose for this matrix, if, if you choose the 18 gig cards, the yeah. CSC cards, they will automatically smart scale to lower formats. Right. So you won't need to then upgrade, if, if the customer comes in and changes their 1080p display to a 4K display, yeah. You won't need to change any other hardware as long as the hardware you've got currently supports CSC. That's fine, no problem. If the hardware you spec is older hardware, which we do still have available for price conscious um, applications, then you may need to update that. But it could be as simple as just pulling out one of these cards and putting in the new card. 
you may also need a receiver to support the same format. So, but it gives flexibility in, um, in your application. And if you, if, for instance, if you know your customer is going to add four zones on later on, you may decide, I won't go for the 8x8 chassis, I'll go for the 16x16 16 chassis, the bigger chassis. And then I can just fill out 8x8 now and add more on later. Or you, you can do it a 2x8 if you've only got two inputs. You can do an 8 input and 2 output if you want. There's the flexibility there to meet your job's requirements. Any other questions there? All right, I want to touch briefly on video over IP just to give you an overview of what Bluestream offers. Um, so Bluestream's video over IP system utilizes a, uh, basically we leverage the best part or most robust part of network infrastructure. Um, you require a one gig managed uh, POE network switch. And we have basically three products in the IP range. We have a transmitter. We put one transmitter behind, oh, sorry, one transmitter behind every source device, so that gets connected by HDMI into my transmitter. The transmitter is then connected via CAT cable to our IP network. For every display in the application, we have an IP receiver, and that also gets connected to the network via CAT cabling. Very, very simple. Um, you can add as many transmitters and as many receivers as you need to a job. Just uh, you have to understand the bandwidth requirements and the network limitations that you have in play. So a 4K source will use about 850 megabit per second. So we nearly fully saturate that one gig link. And a, four, a 1080p source will use about 400 megabit per second. Looking a bit more closely at the products involved, excuse me, our, our, our transmitter supports a 4K30444 or 4K60420 signal. Um, supports all the standard audio formats you'd expect. Fully routable video audio IR232 CEC. And you can route them independently from one transmitter to a receiver. Um, USB type B on here for KVM control. Um, audio embedding, audio extracting, PoE, so you've only got the, the CAT cable, potentially just a HDMI cable as well. You can power them locally in certain applications as well. The receivers have uh, 4K30 video support, um, built-in video scaling. And this is a real benefit if you've got a mismatch of 4K and 1080p screens in a job, because we can automatically scale up or down a video signal with more flexibility than what HD T offers. Because it has a dedicated video scaler built in as well, not only are we scaling from 4K, for instance, we can also scale over multiple displays and over a video wall. So I could scale to a 2x2, 4x4, 16x16 video wall, no problem, all with the built-in scaler, no additional hardware required. Um, an RJ45 loop out for specific daisy chaining applications, um, audio breakout, two, uh, USB for your KVM, you know, keyboard, mouse, etc. Um, those sorts of devices, um, IP232 and IR control of the system, PoE. And the way you control this product is using our ACM200, our control module. So you have as many transmitters and receivers you need per job, but you only need one control module per application. And this gives you a very, very simple web GUI interface for configuration and control of the entire system. An intuitive drag and drop interface, you can see it here, where literally it displays transmitters or sources across the top, displays across the bottom, and I can drag from one to the other on an Android app, on an iPhone, on an iOS, or on a PC. Um, very, very simple, quick, and intuitive. You can set up multiple users and limit their access to certain devices. Um, all of the advanced signal management, so IR routing, 232 routing, is all done through this software as well, through the ACM. IR integration as well, PoE. Um, it also has the ability um, to divide your video network and your control network to be independent networks. Because of the high bandwidth application of the video over IP system, um, it may be, may be recommended to have a standalone video network, and this can separate that from your data network. Or subsequently, subsequently you could VLAN off a network um, to accommodate for the video over IP system. The video over IP can be used in four key ways. One is in a matrix application where any amount of transmitters can be connected to any amount of receivers. Um, to give you an idea of the scalability and the flexibility of this system, uh, the biggest application we've done to date was at the Winter Olympics in Korea, 
a few years ago. We used, there were nearly a thousand endpoints. Uh, it's about 100 transmitters and about 900 receivers um, for the entire application. About, I think it was about 80 kilometers of fiber cable between many venues. It's a dedicated 100 gig backbone um, for the IP network. This is an extreme case, but it just shows you the scalability and the flexibility of the IP system. We've also won the contract for the Summer Olympics coming up this year. Um, so provided the Olympics actually go ahead, Bluestream will be there distributing video. And that's about two times the system size. So very, very flexible in terms of matrix distribution. Can also be used alongside matrix distribution in video wall presentation mode. So scaling over multiple displays, simultaneously as sending video elsewhere. You can use it in a one-to-one -one application, sending one source to one display. It is an expensive option, and there aren't too many use cases where I'd recommend it. hd based T's are generally a preferred application in that instance, um, but there are some applications or some use cases that call for it. And you can use the, HD, uh, the, the cat loop out to go to another receiver in a one-to-many application. So you can daisy chain to the next device if you're transmitting the same source to all of those devices. So very flexible in that regard. So just a really quick comparison between um, multicast, Bluestream multicast, and HD base T. Uh, multicast has virtually unlimited system size. The network is the only infrastructure limiting how many devices you can have. Multicast is more cost effective for larger systems. Beyond an eight by eight or a 16 by 16 in the HD base T world, gets very expensive to keep on adding on sources or adding on displays. You can also have an asymmetric system. You don't have to have 8x8 or 16x16. You can have a 1 to 300 if you want, um, or a 300 sources to 10 displays if, if you want. Fully flexible um, to your requirements. Scalers built in to allow for video wall and legacy displays. Far less bandwidth. So HD base T is sending up to 10 gig of bandwidth. We do use compression with multicast and we're sending up to one gig or 850 megabit per second of bandwidth in a um, 4K application. So much less stress on the cabling infrastructure. Uh, multicast doesn't necessarily require new cabling infrastructure if your cabling doesn't support 10 gig of bandwidth for HD base T. So really important um, to understand your cabling infrastructure requirements. The advantages of HD base T is that <clears throat> Up until 10 gig, HD base T isn't compressed. Multicast is compressed. We don't hide that fact. So picture quality technically is better um, with HD base T. Um, both systems actually have one frame of latency. Um, having said that, if you're going through multiple hops in switches, that can increase latency of a multicast system. But the video latency is, is one frame. Bluestream CSC products still allow 18 gig support. Unfortunately, the, the multicast products don't. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, HD based T systems are more cost effective for point to point or smaller applications. Uh, and multicast is not compatible with other video over IP codecs such as H.264, 265, IPTV, JPEG 2000. It is a proprietary format, um, and in doing so, it means we keep HDCP strictly in control. Having said that, we are, and we showed this at ISE this year, we are looking at a H.265 uh, video over IP solution. So this will come out this year. Um, this is in, I suppose, a final stage, um, but it uses H.265 or high efficiency video coding. Um, it's a much greater compression ratio. Uh, it reduces bandwidth down to about 20 megabit per second. So compared to up to 850 megabit per second for our multicast solution, this uses 20 megabit per second. So technically, it doesn't need multicast distribute signals, depending on the size of your system. Um, at the moment, it'll allow for 1080p, 60 hertz, up to 100 meters or beyond 100 meters. We're not limited by traditional CAT infrastructure because we can now use network switches that support fiber, have fiber between network switches, and distribute the signal many kilometers apart. You also don't need managed switches, so we can distribute over traditional or old infrastructure that's 100 megabit, doesn't require a managed switch because we're only sending 20 megabit per second of bandwidth. Understand your bandwidth requirements though. As soon as we start sending five of these, we're sending now 100 megabit per second of bandwidth. We may require some sort of management like multicast um, or we may need gigabit switches to handle the bandwidth. Uh, it's important to understand that. 
no network configuration is required up until that point. And because it's a, a standardized codec, it's, it will work with other devices such as security cameras, um, NVRs and things like that that also use H.265. And this will be uh, an entry level product, so it will be um, more, more, more cost effective than our current multicast offering. So I think the most important thing to understand is that each of the technologies I've shown you have their place. It's really, really important to understand your customer's requirements before you offer them a solution and choose the solution that best suits their, their needs. We have pure HDMI distribution solutions that don't compress the picture, don't do any conversion, offer you 18 gig support, um, and they're generally the most expensive solutions available, but, or, the, or the hardest cabling infrastructure to run. But if that's the customer's requirements, they are available. We have native HD base T products that have support up to HD base T's limitation of 10 gig. And then we have HD base T with CSC to still allow for 18 gig support in zones that require it. Um, and then also video over IP where you have bandwidth limitations or you need a more flexible or a more scalable solution. So we really have a solution that fits your needs. Don't shoehorn a product into a specific task. Choose the right technology uh, based on the end user's requirements for now and also look to the future of what they may require in terms of flexibility and growth. So that's a really brief overview, hopefully, of all of our current product offerings. Are there any questions there? If you want to know more about the video over IP, I'm more than happy to go in depth. Um, we can spend hours on it if need be, not today. The next solution I want to show you is audio over IP using Dante. <clears throat> so another industry standard technology that Bluestream have now implemented, and we've just launched two products that I'll show you. Um, so what is Dante, or Ordinate, the company behind Dante, they're another Australian company, a Sydney-based company, described Dante as a hardware and software solution that transports precisely timed digital audio between devices using standard IP networking. All devices on a Dante network have a human readable name, so they're not labeled something bizarre. Um, the Bluestream products are labeled according to their product code. So, this product here is DA11AU. The other product I'll show you is DA44AU. That's how they're labeled. Um, precise time alignment of all audio. So Dante used standard networking principles, RTP in this case, um, to basically control latency uh, of all audio devices. Automatic device discovery, so you can connect the device to the network. The Dante software will automatically find that and populate that. One-click audio routing, so changing sources is very simple. Low deterministic latency, so it can be calculated. It's a, it's a known given, it's not a variable that changes wildly. Um, virtually jitter-free and automatic reconnection after power cycle. Benefits of using Dante. Well, it is the industry leader in its field for, for audio distribution. Um, it can send up to 512 channels of audio to and from a device, all through a single gigabit link. So very, very flexible in large channels of audio, large applications. As an example, a typical audio flow uses about 12 megabit per second of bandwidth, and that can be up to eight channels. So, you know, a single device that you've got to put onto a Dante network is going to use minimal uh, bandwidth, which means you don't need any intense network hardware to handle it. Sample rates, various products support up to 192 kilohertz based on the hardware spec of the product. Higher sample rates use more bandwidth or have less channels per flow. And flow is a, an ordinate or a Dante term. If you want to know more about Dante, I implore you to go to their website. They have really, really good training webinars. Um, they offer really good training sessions as well. I recently did one last year um, of their level one, two, and three training courses, and they were really informative. And they take networking principles and present them in a really simple uh, manner. So definitely worthwhile spending time on that. Latency is also dependent on the device and the network. So they give you a very clear guideline depending on how many hops are in your network, how many network switches you have linked together, how to configure your latency. Um, it's also selectable. You can adjust it depending on your application between 150 microseconds and 5 milliseconds. And Dante also handles all audio clocking itself. It does a really good job of this. It uses its own um, election. It actually uses a MAC address to determine election of a device, and if a, de if a device goes offline, it'll automatically determine the next suitable 
uh, application, uh, the next, for, for the next suitable device for clocking. And you can also set preferred clocking devices if you choose. So really flexible handling of digital signals. It uses uh, the Dante controller software. Um, it's a re really straightforward piece of equipment um, to do all of your audio routing. So changing your inputs to your outputs, um, this will handle that. And one important thing to understand with Dante as well is because it's an industry standard, any device that supports Dante will be compatible with any other device that supports Dante. So Radio Parts has some other products that also support Dante. The Bluestream products will interface with those without a problem and they'll all show up um, here in the, the Dante controller software. And they'll all co-mingle, co-exist happily without any um, issues, without any dreadful configuration. Really, really straightforward. You can adjust the clocking, you can adjust the sample rates, you can adjust the latency settings, um, and it's got a really handy clock and latency monitoring status to help fault find and show you where issues may occur. So it's, it's a good piece of software, free of charge, and it works with the Dante hardware. So that's just a really, really quick overview. I've con condensed two days of Dante training down into about 10 minutes. Um, you can really go in depth with it, but hopefully it gives you an understanding and overview of Dante. And now I want to show you the two products that Bluestream has um, that support Dante. So this here is our DA11AU. And all it does is take an analog audio source, it can be balanced or unbalanced, um, and it puts it onto the Dante network. So analog audio in at one end and Dante out at the other end. PoE, very, very straightforward, allows any other device, to, any other Dante device to now see that. So you could take the audio output of Foxtel, feed it into here and put that on your Dante network and distribute that throughout the house. Any analog audio source. We also have, I think I got the title there wrong, but we have our DA44AU, which is a four input and a four output uh, Dante audio device. So it will affect, it will uh, uh, allow four uh, mono channel inputs or two stereo channels input into Dante, and it will be able to extract four channels out as well all controlled through Dante. This one also has microphone support, so 48 volt phantom power. Um, so you could feed microphones into this and distribute them through a premises as well if you needed to. Any questions there on Dante? I know I'm going through quite quickly, but we've got a lot of new products I want to show you as well. All right, so now onto the new products that are either just been launched at ISC this, this month or are on our immediate roadmap um, that will be available shortly. I showed you our Pro 8x8 earlier. The Pro 16x16 is now available as well. And unfortunately, I use the term available a little bit loosely. Um, there was much more demand for this product than we initially anticipated. So we are in a little bit of short supply from our first shipment. And because of recent events in China, um, supply is a bit slower than we anticipated. We are expecting shipping after Chinese New Year and because of recent events, that's delayed slightly. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this product is available. Um, you can specify that into your jobs uh, and allows more flexibility, more inputs and outputs uh, with HD base T and HDMI. Our two HD base T input and two HDMI input card um, will, will be available shortly as well. Um, just again, more flexibility for our custom pro architecture, giving you the ability to put any of our Bluestream transmitters and feed them remotely into the matrix and then out to other, other displays. Two new products that we've launched as well are our HD HDBASD wall plate devices. Um, really well built aluminium front uh, panels, magnetic front panels as well. So they quite strong magnets. We do have the front panels available as spare parts because we know they go missing. Um, you can pass those around and have a look. So. We have two offerings there. One is our HEX 11, which is very simply HDMI in, HD base T out. It'll work with any Bluestream HD base T products. Um, you can feed that in. It is designed for an EU or UK back box. We do include one in the box, so you don't have to go scrounging um, to find them. They are a little bit bigger than the AU um, boxes, but we found universally this is more accepted. Um, so we also have tabletop options available, um, or we'll have some available. So if you're after those, let us know. Um, we'll have some available. So those are available now. And we have uh, a HEX 31. So three inputs, 
HD base T output. Sorry, there's, there's just a um, protective cover on the front of this. So there's actually just a protective cover on the front just to stop scratching, which you'll see the other one's a little bit. It's, it's our test sample. Mm -hmm. Yep. You, you can certainly mount this in, 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 in furniture, in cabinetry, in breakout boxes. You can mount it anywhere it will fit. That's no problem at all. If you take the faceplate off, you can see there's six, uh, six screw holes to mount it. So no problem whatsoever mounting that. Um, so HEX31 features two HDMI inputs and a USB-C input. So one thing you'll, you'll know from Bluestream or notice from Bluestream is that our new products are all coming out with the latest connectivity formats that are being used. USB-C, DisplayPort are all being more and more used within the commercial app environment. And we're also, we've got a strong focus on commercial applications and commercial environments. So you'll see more products that target that market from us. And this is really one of those. Um, IR, RS-232 as well, auto switching, and also the ability to turn a display on and off via CEC automatically, excuse me. So when, it, when a HDMI signal is sensed, this can send out a CEC command to the display at the other end to turn it on. So really flexible in, call it basic automation if you want. You don't then need to press a remote control or have a dedicated control system. Um, this will turn that display on, and then when all sources are disconnected, it can send out the command to turn the display off via CEC. You can adjust that, turn that off. Yes, you can disable that. Yep, no problem. Or you could just have it manual. So you could have it manually triggered when you press the button if you wanted to. So you don't have to find the remote control that could be lost. The next product I want to show you is our MFP62. You can pass this one around. Um, so traditionally, Bluestream multi-format presentation switches have supported legacy formats. So Composite, Component, VGA, those really are a thing of the past. We still have those if you've got jobs where unfortunately you have to deal with that equipment. Um, but we're moving into the 21st century now with USB-C, DisplayPort and HDMI, um, really for a modern boardroom environment. Um, six input, two output. The two outputs are actually linked, so they will always display the same signal, but you could feed one to one TV, one to another TV or to a projector um, simultaneously or into a recording system that records boardroom meetings and things like that. Also has uh, audio embedding or microphone embedding, so 48 volt phantom power from a, for a mic in a, in a boardroom environment. It has auto ducking, so it will lower background audio while um, the microphone's engaged, and then it will ramp back up when the microphone is quiet. And all of these variables are customizable. Um, you can adjust the times of all of these features to suit your application. The next product I think I've shown you before, but this is out now, as well as our HD12 dB. Um, so this is a splitter scalar product that also does Dolby and DTS downmixing. So I can feed in a 18 gig 4K signal. It has a bypass output, so it will output that same signal, and it has a downmix output. And actually it has three downmix outputs. One is obviously video, so it will downmix video and audio. Two, two-channel audio and 1080p or, or a specified resolution. And the optical out and the analog out will always downmix to two-channel audio. So if you've got multi-room distribution where you've got a 5.1 setup, this will downmix that 5.1 audio to two-channel to distribute through your multi-room system. And at the same time, you can still use the bypass output to send a 5.1 channel uh, to your AV receiver. So you can pass that around. Yes, they're all, they're all, all outputs are simultaneous, um, yes. But just understand these three are all two channel. So that, that downmix HDMI is downmixed audio as well, always. Yep. Sorry, so coming out of the optical out is a... Downmixed two channel audio. Two channel, no. Correct, because there are some products that accept optical but don't accept multi-channel audio, some multi-room solutions. So that's the application, or well, that's a good use case for that. Be aware it does only support 5.1 channel audio, so it won't work with Dolby Atmos, for instance. 
The next product I want to show you, this is a, this is a cool new product, a HD11 CTRL. This is what we call an inline HDMI control unit. Um, HDMI in, HDMI out. So you put this in line with your display and what this can do is it can control your display. It's got our smart scale functionality built in so it can, it can convert down to 1080p if need be. Um, built in HDMI equalizer, so like our SM11 um, re-hand or re-clocks the signal I should say, this can also do the re-clocking. But it has automation control built in um, to it. So what that means is via CEC, RS-232 or IR, it can control products. And it can use either HDMI as a trigger or it can use a PIR or an external voltage as a trigger. So you could set this up so that um, when I walk into a room, a PIR sensor triggers this device, projector screen drops by the 12 volt trigger, um, the projector gets turned on by RS-232 and everything's ready to go. And then when you leave the room after 10 minutes of that PIR not sensing activity, this unit will automatically send the off commands to turn everything off. So a really, really handy, powerful, but simple automation controller. Um, so that's available now as well. You can pass that one around. So good for applications where you don't want to put in a full-blown control system, a single boardroom, for instance, or a theatre, where you want everything to turn on automatically and you don't want the customer to have to um, work with it. So simple, cost-effective option there. So yeah, you can learn IR codes into it to then have it spit out based on HDMI detection, whether it's TMDS or 5 volt, or based on PIR trigger or external voltage trigger. So I can do IR232 CEC. Yep, so it, it, it switches off either by PIR after a period of time not sensing a voltage. Yeah, the, the, the time's adjustable. It's all, it's all um, configured via RS-232. So yes, the times are adjustable. You can make it 10 seconds, you can make it 10 minutes. Um, you can also have the HDMI signal trigger the off. So when the HDMI signal, it senses no HDMI signal, it can turn the screen off as well. Yep. So the other new products available are AD11. This is a really simple analog audio delay product. So analog in, analog audio out. It's got two dials, one for volume to adjust the gain and one for delay. So if you've got lip sync issues, um, this is a, a handy product. Just a, a tool to help you overcome any minor issues you might have with, with distribution. Um, so you can very simply adjust the, the analog audio delay on that product to overcome lip syncing issues. We also have an ARC audio extractor, ARC 11. This will take the ARC via HDMI from a TV and convert it to two-channel audio or optical out to feed into a multi-room system or to feed into a soundbar that doesn't for some reason have HDMI. Um, so just, just a tool to keep in the back of your mind for if you've got an application where you need to get ARC out of a TV and your product doesn't support HDMI, you can use this. Very simple and straightforward. Toslink out and analog output. Hundred percent. It's not. It's not because of manufacturers. It's because of distribution. Okay. When when and it's it, and it's because of processing within TVs. Right. So when you're using, it, it may be that you take the audio output of a matrix, yes. and you feed that straight into an AV receiver, yeah. because that's at the rack area. Or a multi-zone amplifier. Getting the signal from that matrix or that AV receiver to the display has a fixed latency. Yep. In HD-based instance, it's one frame. Mm -hmm. But video processing within the TV adds more of a delay and it can be several hundred milliseconds. And the only way to overcome that, you need a way then to delay the audio. So this allows you to then put this between our matrix and the power amplifier and it can add a little bit of audio delay to accommodate for processing in a TV. Because the audio sync feature on the remotes is not zero for years ago. 
Well, well, if, if you're using HDMI, that audio sync is for HDMI typically, or audio coming out of a TV. But when you've got audio coming out of speakers yes. and video in a TV, yes. the, audio, the audio sync feature doesn't delay the audio mm -hmm. because the audio is not coming from the TV. Yeah, yeah. The audio is coming from a source device somewhere else. Yeah. All right. Um, We'll move on then. Um, AMF 42. So we're bringing out another multi-format presentation switch soon. Um, this is, I guess, a higher quality unit compared to the MFP 62. Uh, seamless switching. So it has scaling built in with seamless switching, so you won't get any frame dropping between changing sources. Um, supports full 18 gig. This one does have dual independent outputs. Actually, it's got two, two outputs. One's HDMI only, and the other's simultaneous HDMI and HD base T. Um, and it's got uh, charging capabilities for um, USB-C, so it can actually charge your device that's connected to USB-C, and um, same mic mixing functionality for an external microphone as well. USB-C charging. Yep. PD. We do up to forty watts. Okay. So the the wattage, I guess, is more important depending on your device because there are. A lot of laptops that can do up to 80 odd watts, and obviously we're limited in that regard. Um, so our spec is up to 40 watts. Yep, for phones or laptops. Or um, th this is a really cool product coming as well. Our AMF 41W. We showed this at ISE. It's not too far away. Um, this is essentially a multi-format presentation switch with wireless built in. So. Two HDMI, one HD based, uh, sorry, not HD based, thing, one USB C, so again, supporting the new formats, and also the wireless is an input. And this supports AirPlay and Miracast from your phone, from an Android phone, from an iOS phone, from a computer with Windows or Mac. Um, pass that around and have a look at it. And it works in several ways. Um, you can use this as a standalone device, it'll bring up its on screen menu giving you the SSID you need to connect to, the password you need to log on to that network, and you then connect to it and transmit your video to it through your device. It can also coexist on other networks, so you could hardwire it into a customer's data network if you chose to and use their wireless and then transmit the signal through that to this. Um, HDMI and HD based output, so if you do need to transmit that video to a display far away, you can do that as well. Um, the range will always depend on your environment. In our testing, we found in, in our commercial applications, we get about 25 meters to 30 meters of range without any problems whatsoever. Beyond that, you do start to get frame drops. Um, typical applications, we don't see it being used that far, but you know, small boardrooms, large boardrooms should not be a problem whatsoever. Um, and it will support 4K30 through the Wi-Fi as well from a phone. Yep. Um, no, because it has Ethernet. So you can, you can connect it to another network, another Wi-Fi network, that can act as a wireless repeater instead. So the Ethernet port on that allows you to connect it to any network. If you need an expanded Wi-Fi range, you do it that way, use the third party, because there, there's that many access points and products available that work really, really well. Yes. <laughs> Coming soon. Um, look. I'd like to say within three months. Um, with recent events in China, it is delaying things. So that will most likely have an impact. So one cool thing alongside this product, we're bringing out some tabletop grommets. Um, one's a HDMI, one's USB-C. They have two handy little buttons on them. One says show me, which very simply selects this as an input. And the other says airplane and Miracast, which selects the Wi-Fi as an input. Um, they clamp onto your desktop and, you know, a, re a really simple but powerful solution for a boardroom environment. And so you run your HDMI back to um, the AMF and then you run your three pin control cable back to the AMF. Yeah, so you could, you, could fit, you could have this locally under a boardroom table so you get the best range for that boardroom and then using HD base T you can send the picture to a display using any of our HD-based receivers. What is the distance, cable distance? The, 
the HD based T chipset in this is 40 meters at 4K, 70 meters at 1080p. If you need, if you need longer, you could feed the HDMI into our HEX 150 CS kit, which will give you 4K up to 100 meters, um, or video over IP for that matter, if you needed to, you could feed it into. Yep. You could, you could, um, you could. You definitely could, it just makes the buttons redundant. Yep. It, yeah, it could just be a tabletop grommet for HDMI and the buttons are redundant. That's. How, um, how far can the cable into the grommets be? We recommend you keep it as short as possible. Um, we've, we've tried, so, okay. The caveat is always, what is the quality of your cabling and what's coming out the other end? And I would suggest from this unit, to your source device, keep it within five meters for 4K. You've got to remember that you, yeah, you've got to remember that you do have a join on both ends of this, and that can impact performance. There's no, there's no magic, there's no smoke and mirrors in, in overcoming that. You're adding resistance, you're reducing the bandwidth throughput. So, but mounting this under a boardroom table puts it in its ideal location. If you put it in the center. Um, and it's, the, it's then central and your cables can be as short as possible. Any other questions about that one before I move on? It looks like the, it can be device controlled by like a mouse or something. Is that right? The, um, this, is, right? this is actually for KVM. There's no need to control this device via mouse. Okay. Um, your phone connects to it and starts broadcasting. You disconnect, the next phone connects and broadcasts. So there's no need to control this via a mouse. It has a web GUI for KVM. Yeah, it's for KVM. Um, so you might have a PC hidden away somewhere and you want to control that on the desktop. Have you thought about doing a grommet for that USB? It's on our roadmap. Correct. The grommets won't come till the main unit comes. Yep. We do. I don't know it off the top of my head. It is on our price list. We have the grommets. I believe should be there on, on our February price list. Double check. If not, I can. I, I can definitely let you know. The pricing has been announced, so that's that's fixed. Um, so the other product, and this is really really good for um, many applications, but a HD based T switcher, our SW41 HD BT switcher, four HD based T inputs and a simultaneous, well, it's, a, it's not a simultaneous output, and one output, whether it's HD based or HDMI. This has a really cool use case with our wall plates, where let's say you've got a boardroom or a theater or a stage, um, some sort of a classroom, for instance, where you've got ports set out around the room. You could use our wall plates and feed them back by cat cable into the switcher. This device will auto switch based on what's plugged into the wall plates and bring that source up either via HDMI or HD base T. So it's a HD base T switcher. Is it possible to use active cable for this one? Sorry, to use? Active HDMI cables? Two HDMI cables. Active. Active. Sorry, yes. Yeah, you certainly can. You can use active if you need to move it further. Um, understand that active cables may need power, and they generally get it from the display. So you may... No, you, not from that one. That doesn't power a cable. So you would need to... Um, it is, it is acting as a display, but you may, depending on the device, you may need to feed an external cable, or you could try from the USB socket on that. Yep. So this is a HD base T switcher, four inputs, one output. As I said, really good for, with our wall plates, putting multiple inputs around um, a premises. And it works in two ways. If you're using the HDMI out of it, then um, basically, there's a Class B chipset built in. You can use any of our transmitter products, feed that into the inputs, uh, HDMI out to a display. Just note that only one of these works at a time. They're not simultaneous. If you're using uh, the HD base T output, essentially what we're doing is bridging the transmitter to the receiver through the four, uh, four inputs. So this bridges the transmitter to the receiver and obviously the inputs are selectable. So you can get further range if you use a Class A chipset instead of a Class B chipset. And this is, um, 
uh, web GUI controlled or 232 IR controlled so you could in, in your conference room, in your boardroom, you could have this on an iPad and just an operator chooses what source input. You can rename all the inputs um, and away you go. So simple, easy to use display. Yep. Um, we also have a, a new transmitter receiver kit coming, Hex 70 HDU. This is a bit of a, I guess, a switcher and a transmitter receiver kit all built into one. Um, so it has HDMI, USB-C and display port on the transmitter. It has, uh, it'll have switching between all three of those inputs, but it also has a HDMI input on the receiver. So you could have the receiver behind a TV outputting a signal um, to the TV, but you can also have a local input, a Foxtel box or a, another source, a DVD, a Blu-ray, going into the local input, and then you could have the other three inputs at a boardroom table, or that sort of application. Um, has a web GUI for control as well, IR232 control. So really useful, can also charge via USB-C up to 60 watts, it can charge your laptop or your phone at the same time as that it's transmitting video. So very flexible in that regard. Uh, MFP31, this is a really simple multi-format presentation switcher. Three inputs, one output, may be able to be powered passively or via the HDMI device if it can output enough current, otherwise you can power it via USB. Um, display port, uh, USB-C and HDMI input and HDMI output. Again, really targeted to those small boardroom environments where you need to support multiple formats in a cost-effective manner, all going to a single display. Any questions there? I don't know if it's appropriate, I'll just tell you. So where are we at with what the, what the market's asking about so there are a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of interest from the industry in wireless technologies nobody wants to run cables everybody wants a wireless solution we've evaluated over a dozen different products different technologies and we're finding depending on your use case they aren't reliable in terms of um, bandwidth requirements. They, they, they can't support a full 18 gig signal. There are some technologies that will do heavy compression. Um, distance, a lot of them are very limited to a boardroom. So this, this by all means is limited to a boardroom solution. In our testing, we tested up to about 30 meters in a commercial environment. Um, but depending on your environment, it's gonna have a big impact on the wireless performance. Having said that, it also depends on what you're sending. If you're expecting a residential application where you're sending bit perfect video to a display, it's not gonna happen. We just don't have the bandwidth available. Um, we are looking at some technologies that will do that. Some of them actually use 60 gigahertz instead of 2.4 or five gigahertz. Um, in terms of in a boardroom environment where you're transmitting generally sta static data, stationary PowerPoints, etc., no problem. The amount of bandwidth required is considerably less. Um, this product will do video at 1080p without a problem. It if I'm a friend in client, apart from the boardroom, I come to you and I, you know, and I say I want, uh, I want real time, high quality video distributed throughout the building, all the buildings are purpose built. If, if, yeah, if, if a client comes to me and say, says, I want premium, 100% best picture quality, I would tell them it has to be cabled. No question about it. But if they say, I want flexibility of connecting any device to my system, whether it's a phone, whether it's a laptop wirelessly, they don't want to be hardwired, then this is an awesome solution. For static presentations, for standard, um, standard deaf content, it'll transmit it perfectly. It does compress the picture, but that's how you get it across Wi-Fi effectively. The problem with wireless and the problem I've found, you introduce a stranger device into the environment, and the security that's local won't have a bar of the device. So... Yeah, so that, that, that's a great point. So security is a really important thing to understand as well. Um, this, the AMF41 can work in two ways. It can work standalone, in which it doesn't need to connect to another network, or it can be connected to another network. And you can connect it two ways to another network. You can connect it wirelessly, or you can connect it hardwired. Now, depending on your use case, you have to understand that if you are connecting it to another network, your phone, your computer, whatever's transmitting the video, has to connect to their network as well. And if there are bandwidth limitations on their network, maybe there are a lot of users on that network, 
maybe the access points are flooded, that will all affect system performance. So you have to take that into account. In terms of security, we support all the standard um, wireless security methods, so WPA2, et cetera. Um, there's no issue there whatsoever. And in terms of hardwired security, it's all about how you configure your network. You could VLAN this off to be on a completely separate virtual network, and that's the most secure way of doing it. But it's making sure that you understand, and networking is a whole minefield. It's, you know, there are courses on networking and VLAN and security that really go in depth. Um, but if, if your customer cares that much about it, you should be talking to the IT department with that customer. I wouldn't take, take the security risk on board yourself. I'd inform them what you need. I'd inform them your bandwidth requirements and how best to go about it. Again, it, it, all, it all comes down to your, your customer's requirements. If they want it to work on their network, ours will. There's, there's no issue there. It follows standard networking principles. There's nothing proprietary about the way that connects wirelessly. There are other technologies that do, and there are other technologies that ignore permissions and, and wireless security. Ours enforces that. Having said that, in a company that has that much security, you don't want it broadcasting your SSID and password on the screen, which this will do so you can connect to it. So I'd say in most applications, you want this to be standalone. There may be a use case where your customer says, no, we want it on the network, that's fine. But in most applications, your boardrooms will be standalone. And you could still feed it a network, a hardwired network into it, for instance. Um, but you make sure that's VLAN'd off and sectioned off appropriately. But it's, it's really down to network configuration more so than a limitation of our product specifically. Because what if you're presenting, I mean, this is communications places, uh, it become, if you're presenting sensitive information in the border, as I was saying, but the because they, the, the room goes into a lockdown and certain, certain people have access. Um, yeah, if, if, if you're in an environment where a room goes into security lockdown, I wouldn't be using wireless. There's no way I would offer a wireless solution in that application. I would say you have to be hardwired. You can use the same device, turn the wireless off, disable it, have the grommets on the table, and you say you have to be hardwired. If, if security is that much of a concern to them, then... Yeah, yeah. And, and, but this is, this is every wireless solution. You ha it's a trade-off of do you want wireless access or do you want security? There's, you, you can't, unfortunately, you can't really have both. Perfect. No, thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.